Awesome. Um, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out where I'm supposed to land. The Holy Spirit has been jacking with me a lot lately. Um, in that he's like, hey, this is how you usually hear from me, and so I'm going to talk to you different. And um, he does that sometimes. And um, so, yeah, so I'm, he's, he did it to me on Wednesday, and he's doing it to me today. I sat for a long time in prayer yesterday and just with uh, my Bible open and never really fully felt like I landed. So we're going to ask Holy Spirit one more time just to come, and um, then we're going to see where we go. How's that sound? Terrifying, probably, if you're out there. So let's just, let's invite him one more time, okay? <sighs> Come, Holy Spirit. We love you so much. We honor you as God. We declare your name is great and greatly to be praised. And we just say yes to your ways in Jesus' name. Amen. So the last time I talked, I was talking about the presence of the Lord. It's one of our core values at the Springs is the presence of the Lord. And what we mean by that is there is a manifested or a tangible presence of the Lord. How do you know God is everywhere all the time? Like, he's, he's present everywhere. He's God. It's one of the cool features about God. Like, on God's resume of coolness, that's one of them. He's everywhere all the time. However, <laughs> there are moments and there are seasons and there are places and there are people where there is a tangible difference in the presence of God on their lives. You can go to certain places in America where there is a, what we would call, quote unquote, an open heaven. There is this place where um, if you go to um, Moravian Falls in the Carolinas where they had a hundred year prayer meeting going on. Yes, a hundred years. The Moravians were sold out, freaky believers for Jesus. And there is a clean, an atmosphere that feels clean there because there is a tangible difference in the air. How many of you have ever driven into a city or a place and you feel something and you're like, eh, when you go into a region? Right. Um, it's because there needs to be some more tangible presence of the Holy Spirit there. <laughs> and I got good news. It's inside of you. Hey, so you get to release it. But learning how to host that, learning how to let the God who is in you out of you, and learning how to invite the God who is around you to come upon you, it's, it's both. And learning how to do that is part of the joy of following Holy Spirit. And so I talked to you guys last time about um, David's crazy obsession to be a resting place, to find a resting place for the Lord. How many of you remember when I talked about that? So David's obsession was, he said he lost sleep over it, his family ridiculed him about it, he just wanted to host the presence of God. He wanted to host God's presence. And so we can actually read, tell you what, I think this is where we're going to go. <laughs> Open to Genesis and we'll go any, anywhere, right? We'll just land somewhere. If you have your Bible, you can turn to 1 Chronicles for right now until I change my mind. You can laugh. It's okay. Don't be scared. And I don't have any scriptures back there, y'all, so I'm sorry. 1 Chronicles. <laughs> 13. Let me give you a little history lesson here. This is kind of strange. Where was, what, how do you know what the Ark of the Covenant represents to Israel? You can, sh you can shout it out at me. Yes, the presence of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant is actually also called the Ark of the Presence. The Ark of the Presence. And so this, it's only, it's like God put himself in a box. It just blows my mind. It's like, what? It's like, I've been trying to get out of a box, God. But God, God's presence was, it was represented by the Ark of the Covenant. 
and it had the angels on it. You guys know with their wings touching, representing his throne, where the angels are around his throne. And he would come and he would speak to the priest and he would come down on fire and this glory and this weird supernatural thing that would happen in the Holy of Holies. There was no natural light in the Holy of Holies. There was only supernatural light that landed on the ark. And what's fascinating about the tabernacle of Moses, I have a whole teaching on that because it's just is so yummy prophetically. But everything in the outer court was natural light. You were just living by what you could see. <laughs> but then when you get a little closer into the tabernacle part where you're in the holy, holy place, it's just a little bit of light, the, the menorah. But then when you get into the heartbeat of that thing, there ain't no light but supernatural light. Only the glowing presence of Jesus, of God the Father, of God the Holy Spirit. And maybe the burning stones, which you can read about, like from the priests on this ephod. Because Jewish tradition tells us that those would glow as well, which is freaky. But that was it. But the Ark of the Presence was what Israel had in its midst. Now, the ark was in a place called Shiloh way before David was born, right before, um, right before King Saul. Before King Saul was king, the ark rested in the tabernacle in a place called Shiloh, but there was a priest who lived there, and his name was Eli. And Eli had two really bad kids. You have to watch those preacher's kids. Just saying. My dad, was, my dad was just on staff. I was just the associate pastor's kid. But we loved communion Sunday, me and the other pastor's kids, because that meant free oyster crackers in the kitchen. <laughs> and sometimes pool parties in the baptismal. But nobody knew about that. Just kidding. But no, so the ark was in Shiloh, and Eli was the priest, and his sons were doing all kinds of horrible things. And that's where the ark was was at the time of Samuel, when Samuel was a little boy. Samuel was a prophet. <laughs> the ark would go out into battle whenever Israel went to fight, representing that the presence of the Lord went with Israel to fight her battles. But how many of you know that if you're not in relationship, or if you're not in covenant with God, then you're not on his side? And so Phineas and Hophni, these two rebellious sons, said, hey, take the ark out with you guys into battle. God's totally for you when they had no relationship with God whatsoever. And how do you know the story? Does anyone know what happens? The ark gets captured by the Philistines. Everyone say, dun, dun, dun. There you go. So the Philistines get the, get the ark. And they capture the ark. And when news comes back to Eli, the priest, that the ark had been ca captured. It says that he like falls over backwards, breaks his neck, and dies. Then at that very moment, one of Eli's daughter-in-laws is having a baby. This fascinates me. And somebody comes to her and says, hey, your father-in-law is dead, your husband is dead, and the ark is gone. And as she's giving birth to her son, <laughs> about to die herself, she says his name will be called Ichabod. For the ark, the glory of the Lord is departed. And her one concern, more than her husband being dead, was that the ark had left Israel. Isn't that fascinating? And so her concern, and, and she named her child, because that's what Hebrew people did. Like, I'm so glad my parents didn't do that. Like, whatever crisis they were going through, you shall be called bankruptcy. What? Like, you know, like, that would be horrible. But that's what they did. And so she calls her child, the glory has departed. Because the ark had left. So the Philistines have the ark for a little while. Not very long, because then the whole bubonic plague breaks out against them. But they put the ark on this cart, and they send it back to, to Israel. And it lands in this little area. Long story short, this is really what I'm trying to get to. David did not grow up with the ark in the tabernacle in Shiloh. The tabernacle was still there, but the presence was out of it. 
and ended up in Carith Jerium, or however you say it. So in David's lifetime, you got to get this. There was a tabernacle where all of this, their ceremony was going on, the sacrificing and all of those things on a daily basis. The, the menorah was lit. The, the show bed was placed out. But there was nothing behind the veil because the, the presence of God was actually resting over here separate from the tabernacle. And it says that David, it says over in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, I believe, or chapter 13 maybe, he actually said, hey, boys, I want to go, I want to go get the presence back in the tabernacle. And he said, during King Saul's days, he didn't seek it. And that's what the scripture blows my mind. That's found in 2 Chronicles, I believe, where he says, I want to go get this because King Saul never went after the presence of God. He said, hey, they've got it, and I want it. Back in the day, and maybe some of you, <laughs> let me word this carefully. This is why you need notes when you preach. My life got radically changed by a move of God when I was 19 years old. I was a hot mess, and Jesus broke in. And I threw away a scholarship to go be a part of what God was doing 11 hours away. Because I was desperate to be in a house where the presence of the Lord was. Because I'd been in a tabernacle where he wasn't. Even though we had the routine right. And I left everything to go get that presence. And you know, the greatest critic or critique that I came against in those days, and I still hear it now from people, is, oh, people just chasing the presence, just chasing revival. Yeah, yeah, I am. Well, you are revival. Yes, that's true. Well, you carry the presence, and yes, that's true. But they've got something I don't have, and I will sell everything to find it. King Saul didn't give a rat's patootie about it. But David said, I want it. And we're going to do whatever it takes to get the presence back in our midst. So let's pick up this story, shall we? First Chronicles chapter 13. You guys with me? I hope so. Because I don't know if I'm with me. I don't know where I'm at exactly. But it said... Um, yeah, 1 Chronicles 13 says, David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you and if it's of the Lord our God, let us send out to our brethren everywhere in the land. This is it, verse 3. And let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul. Another version says, we have not sought it. We have not we, we haven't known the presence of God the whole time that he was king. Now I'm going to go back actually to 2 Samuel because I like the way that this is worded better. So 2 Samuel chapter 6. It's the same story, just told a little differently. It says, David said, we're going to go get the ark. We're going to bring back the presents. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, it says they, verse 3 says, they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. That doesn't mean they were literally like driving because they didn't have cars then. In case you didn't know. But there would have been oxen pulling this thing. Anybody know what oxen represents in the Bible? I mean, it does represent strength, but there's something else. It can also be work. Okay? <laughs> That's funny. Um, so they put it on this cart, and it says they brought it out of the house which was on the hill. Okay, verse 5. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir woods, on harps, on stringed instruments, of tambourines, 
symbols, man, they were worshiping, they were partying it up. This, the presence of God was finally coming back. And it says, when they came to the threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark and took a hold of it because the oxen stumbled. Because it's on this cart. And the oxen were stumbling. Hmm. It says, then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his irreverence. And he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And verse 9 says, David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how in the world can the ark come back to me? He's like, leave it where it's at. He said, I don't want this. Let me talk to you guys <laughs> very briefly. A couple things here before we go to the next part. David's intention was absolutely pure. And he was doing everything right from what it could seem with the worship, with the praise, they were excited, everything was going great. But the problem was, they hadn't gone to the Torah, to God's law, to find out how the ark was actually supposed to be carried. How was the ark supposed to be carried? By priests, on poles, on their shoulders. Not, not touching, it's not supposed, yeah, no, no touchy. It's not supposed to be on a cart that oxen are pulling. And so they had that part right, but they didn't have how it was being carried right. And the way it was being carried, if you can even look at this prophetically with me, this, this symbolism here. These men were making it kind of easy in one way, weren't they? They were taking the brunt off of themselves. They said, we don't want to carry this thing. It's too much responsibility, too much weight. So they said, we'll let, we'll let these animals do it for us. We'll just put it on a cart. That's way easier. So one thing that I see here is that they wanted the convenient way. It was a lot of fun. They were still celebrating, but they wanted it to be convenient. You guys see this? Without responsibility. But to carry the presence of the Lord is to come under responsibility, especially if you're going to host it in such a way where he gets all the credit. And so that's one part of this story that I see, that they, they really were just wanting something convenient. Who? Another thing you could say, and I think I'm actually going to stay on this track, but another thing you could say is if oxen also represents work, you can't carry the presence of the Lord just on your works. That'll get you so far. It'll get you so far, you have to carry it from a heart that is burning for him from the inside out. Okay? But let's talk about that, that first idea there for just a sec. They wanted it to be convenient. They wanted the presence of the Lord in an easy way. And I'm not going to be hard about this, I promise. But I want you guys to flip over. I'm gonna actually going to use this Bible because it's my old Bible and it, I, I like it better. So we're going to go over to the Gospels. Keep your finger there and, and Samuel. Are you guys okay with me still? You're so gracious. I think I want to go to, maybe go to Luke. How do you know the story when Jesus enters the temple? <laughs> what does Jesus do when he enters the temple? He does his own kind of dance, doesn't he? John. I'll go to John's. There's two accounts of it. It's really fascinating to me. Um, but he says, when he goes into the temple... And he turns over the tables. What does he say to them? Does anybody know? What did it, my house is what? But you have made it what? John chapter 2. Verse 13. goes like this. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen, sheep, doves, and money changers doing business. Doing business. And this one blows my mind. When he had made a whip, he had to make it, y'all. Mm -hmm. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. Hey, you workers, get out of here. Get out with the other animals. 
poured out the changers' money, and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of... Another version, my version says merchandise. But guess how else that word can be translated in the Greek? Hmm, negotiation. Get it out of here because you're making my daddy's house a house of negotiation. I'll give you this because business is you exchange this for that. It's negotiating. You're making it a house of negotiation. In other words, you're saying what can I get for what you give me? How can I make this e an easy transaction? Do you see this? When here's part of the problem, why was he so peeved? Part of it was you were supposed to raise that little animal in your own house. That was supposed to be a sacrifice that you knew firsthand. That was supposed to be your little sheep that you brought with you and your family to the Passover. That was supposed to be your act of worship from your own house that you brought with you to the gathering. And Jewish history tells us they would have, like, the name of the family even, like, on, on the little lamb. Because it would have been a bloody, slaughtery mess that day at Passover. Because everyone from all around would have been bringing their animals. But then this thing started somewhere along the way in the church of the day, known as the temple, where they said, hey, you know what? You don't have to bring your own worship. You can buy it right here. You can, you can purchase it right here. We will make it easy and convenient for you. So when you come in, it's already, already all you got to do is negotiate a little bit, and you can have something so easy. Do you see this? And so Jesus comes in. The lamb who will be slain at such a high cost. And says, uh-uh. You've made my daddy's house a house of negotiation, and I ain't having that. Because he's fierce. But he's fierce in love for a purpose. And so the same idea is seen in David's time. And David gets offended because this dude dies. I don't see what the big deal is. And I would, I would be scared too. Somebody like Ananias and Sapphira, the scariest like, thing in the Bible. Dude's just dropped dead, and that's New Testament. And I'm like, hey, wait. But I can see why David, David's freaked out by it. But you see, what I love about David, going back to 2 Samuel, what I love about David is that, remember, he has an obsession that he can't just shake. And it is to host God's presence in his midst. And even though he's never even been in a temple where the presence of the Lord is, David has learned what the presence of God is out on a shepherd's field. In his day in, day out life, he's had his own encounters with God and nothing can shake his resolve to have more. And because he's got this obsession in his bones, he said, okay, this dude died. I thought I was doing everything right. Obviously, I wasn't. So let's go back to what God says. And so he goes back to the scroll. It's always a good idea to go back to what God says. Amen? And so then David decides that he wants to actually bring it back. It says in chapter 6 of 2 Samuel that the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his house. And King David finds out about it. And he said, see, I knew I was going after that for a reason. So David said, okay, let's do it right this time. He said, let's go get that presence, his presence, and bring it back. Verse 13, it says, and so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord, <gasps> how are they carrying it now? That's right, they're carrying it because it's made to be carried on your shoulders. It's made to be carried by his people. Those who were created in his image. 
are the ones that he fills. He's not looking to write in on a program. He's not looking to write in on an agenda. He's looking just to come in on his people. But there is a weight of responsibility in bearing God's presence. And I'll talk a bit about that here in just a sec, but let's look at this. Look at what David finally gets. When those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone, please see this. When those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. <laughs> he was wearing a linen ephod. And so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And it says that he was leaping and whirling and acting like a crazy madman. And they brought the ark of the, of the presence back. All right, so the first time David brings it in on the cart, now he's carrying it right. And I don't think it's just that David was being careful. I think that there's a revelation in his heart finally hitting him that this isn't, that even though he was a man who was really casual with God, you guys get that? He's casual with God because he's like, how long, oh Lord, will you forget me? Why don't you slaughter my enemies? He's very casual with God. Like, can you imagine singing some of the psalms in church? Like, I would love to just try that. Let's start at the beginning and just sing through. Oh, that you would slaughter everyone. I hate them with a, with a perfect hatred. Like, like, this dude is casual with the Lord. And God delights in it. You guys remember I said that, that God said of David. What did God say of David? Do you remember what I said? I'm looking for someone after my heart. And there's that boy is. Is he hot, fiery, tempered? Yes, he is. But he brings it to me so I don't mind. So David's very casual with the Lord, but now he's got this other lesson. It's like, hmm, I'm casual with you. I know you. You're my dad. You're my father, and we've got this thing going on, and it's great. But something's different in the assembly. Something's different in the assembly where there's a different weight of responsibility when you come into the camp in a different manifestation. And so something's hitting David where he says, okay, I'm going to do everything I can to keep this thing in my midst. And I want you to see this. This was not just a f like, like a few hundred feet. We're talking over a mile. David carries the presence from here back into Jerusalem. It's a long ways. I can't remember because I haven't studied this in a while. It's a long, t long ways. And it says, how often did he sacrifice? Every one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's sacrifice. Bring me an ox. This would have taken some time, too. Do you see this? It's not just like, go on. Like, build an altar right here. Bring me the stones, bring me the wood, bring me the animal, bring me the priest. Set it up right here, however long that takes. Any idea? A while. Once that's done, one, two, three, four, five, six. Bring me an ox. And the whole thing happens every six paces. And a trail of blood paved the way for God's presence to come back into the temple. Can I tell you that a trail of blood was made for the presence of God to come back into his temple? And it was not a small sacrifice that the Son of Man made. Jesus hung on a cross as the lamb who made the trail of blood so that you could host God's presence in your heart every single day. But then there's this other application to this that I hope you're already catching. Revelation is caught more than it's taught, by the way. But as the corporate body of Christ, we have a cross that we take up every day, right? There's, it's not just his cross. His cross made the way for us to pick up our cross. <laughs> we are living sacrifices, are we not? Romans 12 says, you are a living sacrifice. 
So when I come to the house of God, if we say one of the core values of the springs is going to be that we will host the presence of the Lord, and we're not talking about just something casual. We're saying we are, we are expecting him to show up and show out. And if that means we are on our face terrified because he showed up in holiness, so be it. If that means that he just is here and he kind of kisses us sweet with his presence and we go home in a normal world, oh, cool, cool, that's cool too. If it means that tumors are falling off of people's faces and, and metal is disappearing out of bodies, cool beans. If it means that sinners are repenting and running to the altar, hallelujah. However he wants, to, but we say we will not negotiate, but we will bring a sacrifice in order to host his presence. We will remember the sacrifice that was made and say, I will not cheapen that. But every, every, every step of the way, throughout my week, six days, and then you shall rest with God's people. Every six paces, I'm thinking about my sacrifice. Every, every step along the way, I'm saying, Holy Spirit, I don't have just an end destination just to get to the temple on Sunday. But every, every day of the week, every day of the week, I, I'm, I'm thinking about what I can bring to the house of God to worship with the people. And I'm not going to get there and expect the worship team or expect the preacher to have it all bought up for me and I can just kind of purchase some of what they paid for all week. I'm going to bring my own lamb from my own house because this is my worship that I bring to the Lord. Does this make sense? It's a little heavy. I don't mean for it to be. But David is so freaking awesome because he realized that he was cheapening something that was very costly. And what's cool about David, did God ask him to do that? No. But he's like, I'm going to be as extravagant as I can possibly be. And that's why God said, man, I like that boy. I like that boy. And he brings the ark back to Jerusalem. He doesn't bring it to the temple. Go figure. <laughs> That's later put up in a place called Nod. But he's like, I like this temple. I like this presence. I like his presence. I'm going to build a tent and we're just going to worship around it 24-7. That's what he did until his kid built the temple. But that's another sermon. But David said, whatever it takes to host the presence, I'm going to do it. And I'm not going to negotiate. Springs family, we may never be the biggest fellowship. Or we may be. I don't know. But this much I know, one of our core values is the presence of the Lord. And we will not negotiate from that. I expect that every one of you, when you come here, if you're saying, I am part of this family and this is part of my core value, then I expect that majority of the time, we all, we're all going to totally screw it up sometimes, but the majority of the time you're going to come and you're going to have your own little lamb that you've brought with you. You're going to have your own praise. You're going to have your own testimony of what happened during the week. You're going to have your own testimony of the people you prayed for at Walmart. You're going to have your own story of that friend you led to Jesus. You're going to have, because you have your own worship. Amen? But it also means you're going to pay the price that revivalists before us have paid and that Jesus himself paid where he was often alone with the Lord, often drawing away into the God's presence, often getting away from the busyness and saying, I just need to be with you and I need to seek your face. Remember John 17? Father, I desire that those who you gave me would be with me where I am, that they would see my glory. I'm going to birth this in the earth, God. And that's what he did. And that cry is left for us to pick up and say, yes, Father, I desire it too, that your glory would be with us where we are. Whatever it takes, whatever the sacrifice, we're going to pay it as a family. Amen? As the worship team is coming up, thank you guys. Okay. 
Some of you have never been in God's presence where it is a heaviness. It can get really uncomfortable when he comes in and you don't know what to do. And I think that's what he's after in this house a lot for us. And not just this house, but I just, I know, like, just to go, it's okay, you can throw that agenda out. I want everybody to go ahead and stand. I know you've been sitting a while. <laughs>